If you have your Bibles, turn to me, turn with me to Nehemiah. Nehemiah. We are going to start in chapter 1 and just kind of lay a foundation, uh, but our main focus text is in chapter 4. So if you'll look at 1, put your finger there, and then chapter 4, uh, we'll be ready to go. I want to talk to you tonight about when Satan attacks, okay? Because if you are a Christian, I want to say this right off the bat, you are going to have spiritual warfare. Satan will attack you. And if you notice what he does, he doesn't t- attack you in your, uh, you know, your strong points. He looks for weaknesses. And uh, so we need to be aware of him, his devices, uh, his plans. Uh, and uh, the more you surrender uh, to Christ, the closer you get to Christ, Uh, the more he will be on you, all right? There's some Christians he can just leave alone uh, because they're really, I'm I'm not being critical, I'm just saying, you know, they're not really doing anything for the Lord. Uh, But I'll tell you another area that when you start doing this, you will be attacked, and that's winning souls for Christ, okay? Because that gets him fired up. Uh, So we just want you to uh, know that Satan will attack, and he will attack Christians, and uh, he, he, he won't give up. He will never give up. Uh, Let me go ahead and give you, you have an outline in front of you, but let me give you the outline. Number one, opposition is inevitable. Okay? Opposition is inevitable. It will happen. Okay? It's just a matter of when. Number two, attacks are coming. Okay? Attacks are coming, and we need to be ready for those attacks. Number three, and here's the best one, God will fight for us. God will fight for us. So when we see, uh, you know, uh, you know these things that happen to us, uh, and I've even heard people say this, and I, I have learned, do not say this. What else could happen? All right, don't even let it come out of your mouth. All right, you're giving him ammunition uh, there. But Nehemiah actually means comfort of Jehovah. His name uh, meant that Nehemiah. Uh, was Jewish, uh, as we know uh, what the book says, and uh, he cl- he clearly uh, cared deeply about his people and the Jewish people. Uh, we know even historically, you know, they were in Babylonian captivity. Uh, a lot of them uh, came back, or really, the word remnant means some of them came back uh, to Jerusalem, and uh, they had realized that the, you know, it was destroyed. Uh, before they had left there. And so uh, Jerusalem was just in ruins. Uh, But Nehemiah decided to stay in Babylon. uh, And you will see in just a few minutes, uh, the last verse in uh, chapter 1, for I was the king's cupbearer. And I had to ask myself, why would he stay? Uh, I think he would stay the same reason Joseph stayed in Egypt. Okay, he was a man of power. He was and it wasn't that they had this power deal going. It was just that God used these men in a pagan world. And folks, that's what we need, all right? We need, we need you know, Christians uh, to rise up and Christians to be leaders in our world. So I want to start in chapter 1, verse 1. Uh, you know, the Bible says, The word of Nehemiah, the sons of Achilles, it came to pass in the month of Chesleaf, the twentieth year, I was in Shushan, the citadel, that Han- Han and I, one of my brethren, came uh, with men from Judah, and I asked them concerning the Jews who escaped, who had survived the captivity, concerning Jerusalem. And they said to me, the survivors who are left from the captivity in the province are there in great distress, d- distress and reproach. The wall of Jerusalem is also broken down, and its gates are burned. With fire. So it was when I heard these words that I sat down and wept and mourned for many days. I was fasting and praying before the God of heaven. So he was brokenhearted over the report that he had heard. Uh, he had a burden of folks, and that's the difference between being bothered by something and having a burden for something. When you're bothered by something, it doesn't bother you all the time, okay? But when you have a burden, Okay, your heart is heavy. You seriously make these things a matter of prayer. And, and Nehemiah 
uh, especially was doing that. Then it says in verse 5, and I said, I pray, Lord God of heaven, O great and awesome God, you who keep your covenant and mercy with those who you love and observe your commandments, please let your ear be attentive and your eyes be open that you may hear the prayer of your servant, which I pray before you now, day and night, for the children of Israel, your servants, and confess the sins of the children of Israel, which we have sinned against you, both my father's house and I have sinned. And you can see the seriousness all through the book of Nehemiah. You will see him praying, praying. And folks, that is the key to spiritual warfare. We've got to be on our knees. We have to be talking to God. We have to give these things to God. And he, he was broken. His spirit was broken. Uh, he was hurt. And he, and he not only prayed for himself and called himself a sinner, he's saying we as Israel. And we know why they were in captivity in the first place. They had sinned against God, and God uh, had punished them. In verse 7, and we have acted very corruptly against you and not, not kept the commandments and statutes nor the ordinance which you commanded your servant Moses. Remember, I pray, the words that I say that you have commanded your servant Moses, saying, if you are unfaithful, I will scatter you among the nations. And then he kept talking there. And look down in verse 11, if you would. Verse 11, O Lord, I pray, Please let your ear be attentive to the prayer of your servant and to the prayer of your servants who desire to fear your name and let your servant prosper this day, I pray, and grant him mercy in the sight of this man. For I was the king's cupbearer. And we know uh, he was, you know, talking about the king of Babylon there. And folks, he didn't just taste food. He didn't just sip the wine to make sure it wasn't poisoned. Uh, he was a part of the king's life, and he had an influence on the king. And it's just like Daniel. Daniel, you know, prayed three times a day. You know, you see the, the men of the Bible on their knees praying when they lived in pagan societies. And folks, I'm just telling you, we are a pagan nation now. I don't care what anyone says, just the way we act and the things that we do uh, I, I, it breaks my heart to say it, but we are a pagan nation. In chapter two, uh, Nehemiah, uh, you know, uh, talked to the king, and he basically—I'm I'm just going to sum up two and three real quick here—and asked for permission to go and look at what is going on there. And uh, he gave him. He said yes. You know, basically, he said how long you're going to be gone. He asked for a letter, you know, uh, just an endorsement saying, I want to be able to get through there without getting killed and all that was going on there. And the king basically signed uh, off on that. He also talked to Jewish leaders already there. And really, the last part of chapter 3, he rallied the people. Okay, And folks, I'm telling you, we need strong leaders in our churches, and we need strong leaders in our families. Okay? I'm just telling you, uh, you know, men... That's why, that's why we have men's Bible study. Uh, we need men to rise up and say, as Joshua says, as for me and my house, we are going to serve the Lord. Because I have found out as the Father goes, usually as everyone else goes. So he was rallying the troops. And then in chapter 3, uh, there was the start of the rebuilding, and they talked about the specific walls uh, which they started with and uh, a lot of things going on there. Now look at look at chapter four. And again, Nehemiah had this burden, and he not only loved the people, he loved the city of Jerusalem. But it was so happened. Nehemiah chapter four, verse one. Opposition is uh, inevitable, but it so happened when uh, Sanballat heard that they were rebuilding the wall, that he was furious and indignant and mocking the Jews. So here it starts. And I told you earlier, anyone doing a work of God, you're going you're gonna to have opposition. And then let me say this, especially I've noticed when you're in the mission field, okay, you have to overcome so many obstacles. You're in a foreign country, 
You know, you can't just run down to Lowe's or you just can't, you know, uh, the electricity may not be working. There's so many things. But, but, but he was furious uh, that these uh, Jews were trying to clean up and build Jerusalem. And it said, and he spoke before his brethren and the army of Samaria and said, what are these feeble Jews doing? Notice the questions that he is act, asking. And he's really mocking them. Okay, mocking them. Will they fortify themselves? Will they offer sacrifices? Will they complete it in a day? And again, he's making fun of them, all right? Being rude, really. And will they revive the stones from the heaps of rubbish? Stones that are burned. And really what he was saying was, they can't do it, all right? They can't do it. And I don't know about you, but uh, when somebody tells me I can't do something, (laughs) I'm going to do everything I can to see and prove someone wrong. And uh, one of the things I was told before I came here, and I, if I told you who it was, you, you just would not believe it. But when I first was looking to come here, they said two things. It's vocational suicide was the first thing they told me. And the second thing they said, they will eat your lunch. They will eat your lunch. But you know what? God just blinded me. God just said, don't listen to that stuff. Folks, when you have the call of God on your life, you know, there's no options there. And I'm telling you, Nehemiah had a strong faith in God, and Nehemiah trusted God. Now look at verse 3. And Tobiah the Ammonite was beside him, and he said, whatever they build, even if a fox goes on, he will break down their stone wall. So what happened? You know, other folks and other leaders got in on it, making fun of him. Now, verse 4, Hear, O God, for we are despised. Turn their reproach on their own heads and give them plunder to a land of captivity. Do not cover their iniquity and do not let their sin be blotted out before you, for they have provoked you to anger before the builders. So these four, four different groups of people had got together, and they had surrounded the walls of Jerusalem. They were mocking them, and they were threatening them. But yet, you you have to understand, you know, no matter what comes against you, God is for you, folks. And sometimes things, you know, in situations may not get better immediately. But if you know you're doing the right thing, if you are trusting in God, you just have to, uh, you know, hold on. You just have to believe that this is what God wants you to do. And, and these folks, I'm just telling you, they were used by Satan. They were, they were truly trying to stop a work of God. Look at Psalm 2 with me. Psalm chapter 2. We're going to look at about three psalms today. Psalm 2, verse 1. Why do the nations rage and the people plot in vain? The kings of the earth set themselves and the rulers take counsel together against the Lord and against his anointed saying, let us break their bonds in pieces and cast away their cords. He who sits in the heaven shall laugh and the Lord shall hold them in derision. Then then he shall speak uh, to them his wrath and distress them in his deep pleasure. Yet I have set my king, my heart, my, uh, on my holy hill of Zion. I will declare decree, and the Lord has said to me, you are my son. Today I have begotten you. Ask of me, and I will give you. And the nations for your inheritance, and the ends of the earth for your possessions. You shall break them with a rod of iron, and you, sh- you shall dash them into pieces like a potter's vessel. Now therefore, be wise, O kings. Be instructed, you who instructed you who judge the earth. Serve the Lord with fear and rejoice with trembling. Kiss the son lest he be angry and you perish in the way. When his wrath is kindled but a little, blessed are those who put their trust in him. Folks, another example in the Old Testament was the children of Israel. And they had come up to the borders of the promised land and they were at Kadesh Barnea. And I'm telling you, 10 spies said, you can't do this, okay? There are giants there. There are 
fortified walls there. Yes, there are big grapes. Yes, uh, you know, the land is flowing with milk and honey, but we cannot do it. And Joshua and Caleb tried their best to convince them, listen, God told us he gave us this land. We need to do this. And you know what? All through the Bible, what did God do? What did God do? You think of all the miracles in the Bible. Folks, there, I mean, the crossing of the Red Sea. We could just raising uh, Lazarus, Jesus raising Lazarus from the dead. God did the impossible. He did the impossible. So what Satan wants to do is he, he wants to mock you. He wants to say, you know, you're crazy. This is not going to work. But folks, we have to stay the course. Okay, we are going to be attacked. It's going to happen. I heard a wise pastor tell me once, either you have been through the storm, either you are in the middle of the storm, or you are coming out of a storm. And we look at Job's, you know, the book of Job, and we can see that in a mighty way. But opposition is going to be against you folks, and you just have to to keep doing, keep obeying, and keep following God. Not only is opposition inedible, number two, attacks are coming. Look at verse 7. Verse 7, so we built the wall, and the entire wall was joined together up to its half height, for the people had a mind to work. And again, when we think about a mind to work, uh, folks, no matter what you do in life, whether you're trying to build a church, uh, when you're trying to establish new missions, uh, when you go overseas and when you do all these things, folks, the, the word W-O-R-K cannot be left out. Being a Christian, listen to me, it takes work, okay? It, it's not easy. If somebody told you, hey, you, you're not going to have any problems, you know, every day you're going to get up and kind of just fly into your pants and, you know, everything's going to go good. You're never going to have a problem. Folks, somebody, somebody lied to you, all right? To be a Christian and to be effective in the Christian work, it takes work. Somewhere, somebody has to roll up their sleeves and they have to go to work. Verse 7, now it happened when Sanabat and Tobiah and the Arabs and the Ammonites and the Ashdods, you know, these were all the ones uh, against him, heard that the walls of Jerusalem were being restored and the gaps were being uh, beginning to close, that they became very angry. They got angry before, now they're very angry, uh, furious before, and all of them conspired together to come and attack Jerusalem and create confusion. Who is the author of confusion, the Bible says? It's Satan, folks. He wants to confuse you. And folks, he is successful sometimes. All right? You know, a lot of times, you know what the problem in my life is? You want to find out what the problem is in your life? Go in your bathroom and look in the mirror sometime. Sometimes, man, I'm good. I'm on fire. I'm excited. Then other times, man, I'm just coasting. I'm just, I'm taking days off. I'm, I'm doing that. Folks, the fight is within. The fight is in your head, okay? It's right here. And, and we must realize that Satan wants to get in our head. And you can, you know, you know what, what I do, I like to talk, I like to, when I'm alone, I like to talk, give myself a, a pep talk. You ever do that? Just give yourself, I, I'm not going to do that. I'm not, you know, just talk and then talk to the Lord. Give it to the Lord. So these folks are creating confusion in their minds. Nevertheless, we made our prayer to God and because of them, we set a watch against them day and night. What is that a picture of? Well, that's a picture of spiritual warfare. We are watchmen. We have to be able to identify the attacker. We have to identify the strategy. We have to realize that we don't wrestle against flesh and blood. That lost boss that gives you a hard time, really isn't your problem, all right? It's God's problem. Give, turn them over to God and let God take care of that, all right? 
Just be the best employee that you can be. Do the right thing. And so what did they do? They set a watch up because they were being threatened. And it says, and Judah said, the strength of the laborers is failing. There's also so much rubbish that we are not, we are not able to build the wall. And what happens? Satan attacks, and he attacks and attacks, and then we start believing what he's saying. And again, I think a huge mistake Eve made, she answered the call to conversation with Satan. All right? He's not going to be able to tell you to do something if, you, if you're not engaged with him. If you just say, hey, say it out loud, the blood of Jesus Christ covers my soul. Just say, hey, I'm not listening. Okay? Now verse 13, and our adversary said they will neither know nor see anything till we come into the mist and kill them and cause the work to seek. What were they wanting to do? Destroy the work of God. Destroy the work of God. So it was when the Jews who dwelt near them came that they had told us ten times from whatever place you turn, they will be upon us. So Satan attacks, and attacks are coming. And folks, there are times it'll just be wave after wave after wave. And you will even find yourself asking, is this ever going to stop? Am I going to get victory? And folks, uh, there is victory in Jesus. My Bible says, greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. You have, and, and we'll be talking about this here in just a second, you have armor that can help you in these situations. Matter of fact, in fact go to Ephesians chapter 6. Ephesians 6, the Bible says in verse 10, Ephesians 6, 10, Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. See, sometimes we quote Scripture and emphasize the wrong word, okay? You believe I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me, but how you say that makes all the difference in the world. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. What does that mean? Folks, no, in my flesh, it, it, me alone, I cannot do that. But I'm telling you, with God's help, I believe you can do anything. If God has a purpose and a plan for your life, you can do it. You can, you know, through him, make that happen. Finally, brethren, put on the uh, no, finally, brethren, be strong in the Lord and the power of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. That's the schemes. Okay, he got a plan for you. He has a plan of attack. He attacks you when you're vulnerable. Verse 12, for we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of darkness of this age, and against uh, a spiritual host of wickedness, in the heavenly places. And folks, I am telling you right now, Satan is having a field day in this world. A field day. And do you know why? Here's why I believe he's just attacking. He knows his time is short. He knows if I'm going to do anything, you know, if I'm, if I'm going to take captive, these captives, I have to do it now. Verse 13, therefore, take up the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand in the evil day and having done all to stand. Have you noticed something about the armor? That it all protects you, especially when you are facing the battle, when you are facing the enemy. All right? But sometimes when we run the other way, folks, we don't have as much a protection. God doesn't want us running, folks. God wants us trusting and facing and realizing and I, I just, you know, I think of the walls of Jericho. That, that is the craziest battle plan. I mean, you know, Joshua, I'm sure he was telling his generals what was going on. He goes, do what? what are you, you mean walk? We're going to be tired seven times on the seventh day? And then we're going to fight? No, God's going to fight for you. Folks, 
they destroyed the wall and they took Jericho. And then the rest of that is the armor of God. And I'm telling you, I've told you this for 19 years. When you walk into my closet, I've got three sides, you know, three walls and clothes and shoes and everything is in there. And at eye level, where my shirts are, is written the armor of God. And I'm telling you, every day when I am buttoning up my shirt, I am, I am reciting the armor of God. It's right here. And folks, we need to do this every day. We need to be ready for battle. Okay? We need to be ready. And that's what he is saying. Opposition is inevitable. Attacks are coming. And God will fight. <coughs> Excuse me. God will fight for us. Now look at verse 13. Therefore I position men behind the lower parts of the wall at the openings. And I set the people according to their families with their swords and their spears and their bows. And I looked and I arose and, arose and said to the nobles and to the leaders and to the rest of the people, do not be afraid of them. Do not be afraid of them. Uh, remember the Lord, great and awesome, and fight for your brethren, your sons, your daughters, your wives, and your houses. I don't know. You, you know, there are just certain people that are just born leaders. And I'm telling you, there were coaches like that. You know, you played for coaches like that. I mean, if they told you you can run through a wall, you, you would try to run through a wall, all right? And that's what Nehemiah was doing. Nehemiah was empowering them. Nehemiah was saying, we can do this. Folks, I believe with all my heart, we as a church, and I'm talking about ministry, we can do anything, any ministry with God's help. We can, you, you just name a ministry. And God is placing people here and in positions here to where we can, you know, fight against the gates of hell. And it says, do not be, and do not be afraid of them. In verse 15, and it happened when our enemies heard uh, that it was known to us and that God brought their a plot to nothing, that all of us returned to the wall, everyone to his work. So it was from that time on that half of the servants worked on construction while the other half held spears and shields and bow and wore armor. What does that mean? And they were ready for battle. I mean, yes, they were doing a construction. And yes, it probably slowed them down some, but when the enemy was seeing what was going on and realized there were people that had spears in their hands, and I know even the people that were working, you know, they had a trial in one hand and a, a spear in the other. What were they saying? We're not going to be afraid. We're going to fight you. We're going to fight you to the end, all right? And that, that fear left them because of the Lord. In verse 17, and those who built on the wall those who carried burdens loaded themselves with one hand and they worked construction and with other word, uh, other they held a weapon. Every one of the builders had his sword girded at his sides as he built and no one, and the one who sounded the trumpet was beside me. Why the trumpet? Because when that trumpet sounded, it meant rally the troops. See, they were all around this wall and they had built the wall up. They had repaired the gates. And so, you know, to, to finish the work and to finish what they did, uh, they had to be on guard. They had to be ready to be attacked. And then, verse 19, And the nobles and rulers and the rest of the people, and the work is great and extensive, and we are separated far from one another. Wherever you hear this trumpet, rally there. Our God will fight for us. You know what happened? You know the rest of the story. They finished it in record time. 52 days. Folks, I love when God shows up and shows out. I love when God tells and, and proves that he is God and shows people that all things are possible with God. Because, it, and I am telling you, fear is the number one enemy you know, uh, you know, Satan uses against us. He wants us to fear. He wants us to doubt. And I'm telling you, 
our God will come through. Really, fear and intimidation are Satan's number one tool. There's no doubt in my mind. Psalm 91. Go to Psalm 91. Psalm 91. He who dwells in the secret place of the Most High shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. I will say of the Lord, He is my refuge and my fort fortress. My God in Him will I trust. Oh, folks, that secret place is the presence of God. That's why, folks, I keep telling people this is not an auditorium. This is a sanctuary. This is a place where God is. This is a place where the Holy Spirit is. And this is our refuge. I'm telling you, some of the most peaceful times I have is when I am in this building right here, in this place, when it's pitch dark outside and the only thing showing is our lighthouse. You know what I do sometimes? I just go to different parts of the place and I just sit down, Betty, and I just start praying. Why? Because God's here. I feel more safe here than I do in my own home. I mean, there's, I, I don't mean that in a negative way. I'm simply saying this is our refuge. Why? Because God's here. Verse 3, surely I shall deliver you from the snare of the fowlers and from the perilous pestilence. He shall cover you with his feathers, and under his wings you shall take refuge. Folks, you can see that of a mother bird and then little bitty, bitty chicks, the little baby birds are totally depending on the mother. His truth shall be your shield and buckler. You shall not be afraid of the terror by night, nor by the arrow that flies by day, nor by the pestilence that walks in the darkness, nor the destruction that lay waste at noon. What is he saying? Don't fear anything. Don't fear anything. I got this. Man, I got this. A thousand may fall at your side and 10,000 uh, at your right hand, but, you should, but it shall not come near to you. Only with your eyes you shall look and see the reward of the wicked, because you have made the Lord, who is my refuge, even the Most High, your dwelling place, no evil shall befall you, nor shall any plague come near your dwelling, for he shall give his angels charge over you to keep you in all your ways. In their hands they shall bear you up, lest you dash your foot against the stone. You shall tread upon the lion and the cobra, and the young lions and the serpents you shall trample underfoot, because he has set his love upon me, therefore I will deliver him. I will set him on high, because he has known my name. He shall call upon me, and I will answer. I will be with him in trouble. I will deliver him and honor him. With long life, I will satisfy him and show him my salvation. Oh, folks, he is our refuge. He is our strength. He is our strong tower. He is almighty God. Father, thank you for just the scripture. I just love the Old Testament and the stories. And God, I know Satan attacks and I know sometimes it comes in waves. But God, there's also peaceful water. There are times where we are, Lord, the storms aren't raging. And God, I just want to thank you for those times. And God, I pray that we would be strong when we are attacked. Help us to understand we don't wrestle against flesh and blood. Man is not our problem. Lord, it's Satan, it's the demons, it's the evil forces in this world. So, God, I pray when the, the attacks come that we'll just really, really uh, be strong in you. God, I thank you that you fight for us. God, that's how we make it. And, God, I thank you that, uh, Lord, uh, we are not going to be defeated. We aren't. So, God, thank you for always being there. Thank you for being in the fight with us. And, God, I pray you'd give us courage. Courage. Joshua chapter 9, 1, Joshua 1, 9. Be strong and be courageous. And I pray that we would do that. God, we love you and we thank you. In Jesus' name I pray, amen.